Again, if you want to read the rest online, please do. Um, I'm going to just set it up a little bit so that you know kind of where we are when we start into the story. So the main character is a woman named Yona, uh, and she's the mother of two young boys uh, in New Jersey. Uh, you know, typical harried mom. Uh, she's just dropped them off at school, and she's escaping into New York City to uh, work on kind of a beginning business that she has. Uh, actually kind of as a fashion designer uh, for Orthodox women, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, and it's a business she barely has time for because she has barely, you know, time for herself, uh, you know, as, again, as a mother. Uh, so that's kind of where she is uh, when I jump into this, uh, driving into the city. She didn't have to have a job that made money. More than anything, it was she who did this to herself, she who overbooked her time and overestimated her devotion, she who sold herself short. She did it when she said yes to everything, or when she didn't say no, and then she had to deal with the fallout. But now she had to focus. She was entering a war zone, and of all her battles today, this one was her own. Some days she visited the couture shops before the fabric wholesalers, and some days it was the other way around. It made more sense to do the fabric last. That way she knew what she was getting and what she needed to supplement it, but she could guess, and she was usually right. She had a sense for these things. Sometimes she wanted to delay the reward of shopping, build up to it like a climax, savoring the anticipation in her mouth. Today she needed the reward as soon as she could get it. She parked, acquired coffee, weaved her way on the sidewalks through the late commute crowd, tech, artists, single people, and the early shoppers, the trust funded, the uncommonly beautiful, single people or pretending to be. The city throbbed and she welcomed the long forgotten feeling. She constantly tested herself. Would they notice the nonchalant long sleeves of her bodysuit shell, her collarbone covered, her skirt cut smart but long? She'd been orthodox her whole life, and she constantly obsessed over the image that she projected. But each day was a new unsureness. A gaggle of young girls from television, maybe, or college students, pointing at her and whispering, is she one of those people, was enough to destroy her for the entire day. Inside a small, clean, and metallic Soho store, a young, tall man served her. He, too, lingered on Yona's outline, watched her form shrink as she browsed from the near side of the aisle to the far. Her practiced hands stroked each item on each rack, so adept that they worked without her brain's interruption. Automatically, she scrutinized its softness, its sturdiness, its breathe and feel and weave matrix. She tore past outfit after outfit, watched the progression passively. She waited for colors and patterns to sell themselves to her. She used to do this ravenously, filling her arms with maybes and making her final cuts at the register. She had learned to be conservative with her requests. The salespeople became less frustrated. They were more forgiving. They helped you when you required it rather than exhausting your tab before you'd even thought about cashing out. She found her prizes, summer blazers, part sheer, vaguely Indian, half a dozen a shiny leather-esque jacket, a pinstripe pencil miniskirt that flared out at the last minute. The last one was the one that struck her. It was perfect for one client in particular, Ava Luna Mizrahi, a stick of a woman who favored both tightness and stripes. She was absolutely stick-like, and she liked to drive it home. The design, the flow of the piece, the skirt was exactly what Yona needed chaos and order in a rare conjugation. She just had no idea what she would do with it. The mini skirt was designed for brevity, to be a nothing thing, taking a back seat to the straddling of legs and some formative top. Most clothes were easy, and when it came time for Yona to decide what surgery she would perform on them, they revealed themselves immediately to her, elongating hems, filling in holes, sewing up slits. She was careful to be subtle, always an extension of the original design, never an affront to it. This pencil mini, though, it might elude her. 
There just wasn't a there there, not enough to work with. But something about the mini wouldn't let her let it go. It was an aesthetic seduction, an immediate crush that wouldn't let her out of its power, drawing upon her sense of visual umami. She lay out the skirts atop the flimsy items on the clearance table, the whole stack of them, and she watched those skirts. She lay them out side by side, and she waited for the skirts to share their secrets. Excuse me, madame. The madame stung her immediately, not the formality of it nor the fake French, rather the intimation that she was old enough to require a title. I'm sorry. She was careful not to look up too fast. It was the proprietor, of course. Or no, he was a salesboy, young, elegant, sure of himself, never a doubt about any word that he spoke or gesture that he made. He was approaching her. He was regarding her arrangement of skirts. If you'd like to see something up close, we have rooms in the back. He'd mistaken her for a customer. She was not. She was a buyer. He'd seen her in here before, what, half a dozen times? Eight, nine? She thought she was memorable. She didn't think of it as haughtiness, just a matter of fact. Her look, her personality, the quantity of her purchases, the fact that no other remotely orthodox looking woman, whether or not she was trying to look it, ever stepped foot in here. She didn't yet qualify for quantity discounts. This she knew from discussions with the proprietor, the real proprietor, a portly and well-muscled gay Israeli man in his 50s with the unlikely name of Tal, Hebrew for do, who always addressed her harshly but fairly. But she hoped to become recognized, at the very least contended with, she focused. She tried to focus. Don't worry, she said. I'm getting these. It was so hard to concentrate, to think of only one thing. She needed to push the world out of her mind. She played with the skirts, the idea of the skirts, iterating through a dozen different alterations, extending the pattern vertically, a blackout strip that reached beneath the knee, tacking it onto a shirt. None of her ideas gained traction. The skirt was microscopic. It was wider than it was long, damn it. It was that flare at the bottom that was giving her so much trouble, so cute and so problematic. How to capture that last second shock, but without simply stretching out the rest of it, shaping it into a giant bell jar shaped lump. The six skirts were spread in front of her, two by three, the sizes increasing imperceptibly, a slow creep from topmost to bottom, Two, four, six. I'm really going to have to ask you to move. The clerk was itinerant, his voice shooting up in pitch, growing nasal with presumed authority. Now I have to do this whole table over again. Just pick out the one that you want and get it over with. And maybe it was the pressure that did it, that made all the cacophonous parts of her brain suddenly harmonize. A connection, a pyramid, joined three skirts one above the next, sewn at the flare, each of them increasing gradually in width to allow for leg movement. It would be ridiculously expensive. Each of these skirts, even before her markup, was ridiculously expensive, way more than any single style piece of fabric had any right to be. But there were women who would pay for it. One of those women was Ava Luna Mizrahi. There were others. More would find her if her business were given a chance to grow. Her clients had confidence in her, more confidence than she could ever muster about herself. That's fine, she said, sweeping them up. I'm finished here, and cleaning up is your job, she said, eyeing the table one last time to make sure the clothes were relatively unmasked. Just like shopping here is mine, I'll take them all, and tell Tal I'll be in touch about the rest of my order, and I'll make sure to mention all the help you've been. <laughs> Out on the street again, and back in her head, Yona's parting comeback turned into a victory. Even if the salesboy hadn't crumbled into a pile of ash with her parting repartee, even if the snideness of his smile flinched somewhere between well-masked and not at all, she'd still gotten in the parting shot, hadn't she? And even if she no longer uh, had, or even if she had no larger order with Tal to speak of, well, someday she might. 
or if he called, she could always come up with something. Order more of the same, another six mini skirts to blend into two long skirts. A deflation of ego always came after these shopping expenditures, knowing the money she spent there was not her own. The profits from her previous sales paid for some of it, but compared to her husband's earnings, her own budget was a meager nothing. She was always trying to grow bigger, and because of this, her business enterprise was always running in the red. This neighborhood is what saved her. This was where she grew up, and it was a world away. Even 20 years ago, the neighborhood was dying. The Jews running away, the silver shops and kosher restaurants shutting down, or moving west across the rivers, grandchildren forfeiting their grandparents. The streets felt like a secret language all her own, the indentations and buildings she'd hidden as a child, the corner groceries and secret gardens stuck between lots. When she was young, most of the people she'd known had been old, people who'd grown up there and never moved and were also getting ready to die there. There was no way any of them were left. The area was trendy now. Buildings had been scrubbed to their original faces, carved stone and exposed brick. Residence hotels were remade into luxury apartments, tenements into penthouses. Old diners became new bars. She could imagine what her childhood apartment rented for these days or what kind of people might be living inside. She passed the corner in which she'd had her first and last cigarette at the age of 12, proffered by Gavin Lodi, an older boy. She could have cared less about him, but was entranced by the experience, made eager by the prospect of sucking fire into her lungs. And when she did, all she could taste was ash. Later that afternoon, Gavin tried to kiss her, but she was still disgusted by the taste, disgusted by her very lungs themselves, and she'd shoved him away right off the curb and into traffic. With a shock, Yona realized she was closer at that time to her son's age than to her current age. She looked back. The corner had dropped out of sight. She forced a shiver, trying to shirk the past, feeling it swelling around her, unable to let it go. Today she found salvation, a teenage boy, a skater, coming the opposite way down Stanton, dead stopped in his tracks, gave a long, indulgent, thirsty check of her body. It was unabashed. It kind of scared her. It grossed her out to think what he might be thinking, if she permitted herself to. She had never wanted to traffic in the affairs of boys. That was, of course, before she found herself surrounded by them. But today she drank it in. She reveled in it. She allowed herself as a matter of professional pride to take it as a compliment. Her phone went off, the jarringly silent vibration that call that each day shattered her and sent her limping back into life. The alarm that meant her son's departure from daycare was imminent. She had to pick them up. Across the bridge, a full state away, she was late. <laughs>